Hi class. Today we're going over rated graphic film. We're going to be looking at the composition and characteristics of film. And I'm here to tell you, being a previous darkroom tech that handled many, many thousands of films, I'm so glad film's gone. This is one of the reasons. We used to have film libraries, and in these film libraries would hold thousands and thousands upon films, depending on how big the department is. How we would utilize these is we do a radiographic examination and then go pull the film jacket with the previous films in them for the radiologists to compare with. These folders were color coded and numbered with the medical record number so they'd be easy to find. So please go over the objectives of this class. I will attach the PowerPoint to your Blackboard course so you can overview this in a future time. So let's look at the type of films we'll be talking about today. Uh, good old screen film, what we know from the past. You have direct exposure, mammography film, laser film. Specialty films include duplication, subtraction, cine, and spot film. And then we have a special film for dental radiography. It only makes sense that Rinkin was the one to choose the first type of image receptor. He was doing these experiments with phosphorescence and radiation. But as we go along in the 21st century, we see that the film as an image receptor is giving away to the di digital imaging world. However, students still really need to understand film screen technology. It just makes understanding contrast and density so much easier and different properties, image properties like that. Going back to the original base Rinkin was dealing with, he used glass. He would take this glass and he would cut it with his emulsion, his reactive phosphorescent emulsion. Uh, the problem with this is that glass is glass and it will break. And so they had to come up with something that would uh, be a little bit more durable. Also, there was high exposure factors related to using this type of medium. So if you ever hear the, the term flat plate, it usually refers to an abdomen. And usually what that goes all the way back to this original glass flat plate. So if you ever hear that, that's what they're talking about. Because of a glass shortage during World War I, they quickly switched to cellulose nitrate. And the problem about cellulose nitrate is it's highly flammable and they had some real devastating fires in the 20s and 30s to show that they needed to come up with something better. So they went over to cellulose triacetate. This was considered a safety base because it was less flammable than cellulose nitrate. This all came down in the 1920s. Disadvantage was that the films would warp pretty easily and they wouldn't just uh, hold up to today's polyester films. So that's where we're going. We switched to polyester. It's the base of mo uh, today's modern film and we see it, that light blue film out there. Uh, it's, it, that was introduced in the 60s and that really made a big difference because these really do hold up very well. So let's go over the components of a radiographic film, polyester radiographic film. So starting with the base layer, we have that right in the center here and it's connected to an adhesive layer that keeps the emulsion intact and then we have a super coat to help uh, durability of that. And we will be going over all those individual elements here. So the base layer is 150 to 300 micrometers. It's made of semi-rigid polyester and it's lucent with a blue tint. Now this blue tint is what helps to reduce the fatigue on the radiologist's eyes. So we also have an adhesive layer with an emulsion. The emulsion is 3 to 5 micrometers. It's composed of gelatin, which has the silver hi highlight crystals in there. And then, of course, we have the protective coating over the top of that. So the foundation of a radiographic film base is that the modern base is a thin sheet of polyester. And this has worked out really good because it's very durable. Uh, and it's very resistant to fractures. It's rigid enough to be put up on a view box hundreds of times. The radiolucence uh, of it is very uniform. The film must retain its size and shape throughout the use of the processing, so the polyester is proven to do that. It does not contribute to image distor distortion or also what is called dimensional stability. A typical film that you'll find ranges from 150 to 300 micrometers, but the newer film that is being constructed these days is about 175 micrometers. So I had mentioned the blue tint, and the reason for the blue tint is it reduces the eye strain to the radiologist. 
Uh, and in doing so, it increases diagnostic accuracy for these radiologists. You can imagine 8, 12 hours a day reading films. Uh, this blue tint really helped to take the edge off. So this blue tint is added during the manufacturing process. Another benefit to this tint is the crossover effect. And the film base is coated with a special substance to prevent the light from one screen crossing over to the other, causing the blurring of the image. So take a look at that. So we have a phosphor here, photons coming in. It is making a glow, right? So if we didn't have a base that would stop that, that glow would go over to this phosphor and expose this, this image is going to be different than this, right? This is going to be a little bit more magnified than this one right here. So with that tint in the base layer, it can, it's considered the crossover control layer because it doesn't allow the phosphorescence of this side of the film to cross over to this side. So the film base is composed of polyester, and that gives it a good structural foundation for the emulsion layer. It must be flexible and durable. It shouldn't shrink, so it keeps its dimensional stability. The base is un uniformly loosened, so as not to contribute to any irregular shapes to the image. It's 150 to 300 micrometers in thickness, and remember that the newer films are about 175 micrometers. So looking to the adhesive layer, this binds the emulsion to the film base and allows for proper emulsion distribution over the base throughout the use of the process. And this helps with uh, preventing any like bubbles or distortion when the film is being bent uh, during processing or handling. The sole purpose of having film at all is because of the emulsion. It is the heart of the film. It's composed of silver highlight crystals suspended in gelatin. It is homogeneous and the active ingredient is the silver highlight crystals. Typically these are 3 to 10 micrometers in thickness. Now I believe you have a couple books. One might state 3 to 5 micrometers and there might be another book out there that says 5 to 10, but for quizzing and test taking purposes, we're going to go with 3 to 10 micrometers in thickness. So there's a gel suspension uh, that holds this emulsion. It's non-reactive medium, and so for which the chemicals can penetrate and, and process the silver highlight crystals. So the gel is inert uh, and non-reactive. Distributes the crystals evenly over the surface of the films, and this keeps the silver from clumping together, making one more, uh, one more area, right? One more area, more sensitive to radiation than others. Uh, must be clear, so light can travel through it uniformly, and made of gelatin like we eat, but just a higher quality, more dense. X-rays interact with this layer to form the image, and again, this layer is made up of silver highlight crystals embedded into a gelatin which is clear. It's made up of silver bromide, 95 to 98% depending on the manufacturer, silver iodide, 2%, and silver chloride sometimes is put in there. Silver iobromide is the name used as when the emulsions of silver bromide and silver iodine are combined. All steps of the manufacturing process need to be done in total darkness. The crystal production, the ripening, the mixing, and the coating are all done in the dark. So here's the structure of silver highlight crystals. You can see the, the bromide, you can see the silver, and you can see the iodide over here. It all is composed to make this phosphorescence happen. Quickly, the process of silver highlight crystal formation Remember, it's a pure metallic silver dissolved into nitric acid. This forms a silver nitrate. Silver nitrate combined with potassium bromide and gelatin. The silver bromide will participate, precipitate out, and the potassium nitrate will be washed away as a waste product. And the gelatin must be present for the crystals to form. So these silver highlight crystals are tubular grains that are flat. Uh, they're two, or, two to four times larger. Uh, than other crystals that have been used and can be more evenly dispersed in the emulsion. And the advantages to all this is the absorption of a great portion of the exposing photons, which is very important to us, uh, the reduced light crossover, we talked about crossover, uh, reduced silver coating requirements, you could save some money there, and it's 45 second processing, which is fast, pretty fast compared to the others. Downside is that it's very sensitive to the chemicals in the processor. And as we talk about the processor, you know, we will see uh, the importance of that chemistry in there.
Here we can see some pictures of some crystals. This is the conventional silver highlight crystals. We can see where they were irregular in shape. And then new technologies make them more flat and broad and table-like grains. And even have some cubic grains going on over there. So here's just a little snapshot of the gelatin suspending this. And you can see the uh, tubular silver halide crystals right here in the structure in this lattice. So the silver halide crystal structure, it's, the resultant shape can be in many varying forms. However, the inner structure takes on a cubic form or a cubic lattice. They're bound by, together by moderately strong ionic bonds with silver uh, being positive and bromide being the negative. The crystal structures permits both free silver atoms and free electrons to drift through the lattice. So take note of this little area called the sensitivity spec right over here. What is that? So that's like silver and gold sulfide creates imperfections in the crystals. And actually these imperfections are what allows the crystals to be good for imaging uh, and has uh, good imaging properties to it. So this allows for the collection of many silver atoms in one area after being exposed to the X-ray or light photon. So the spec actually allows the structure to become exposed and give off a density. The structure of silver bromide is not perfect in size or shape. It's responsible for the chemical contamination of silver sulfide. Silver sulfide is introduced by chemical sensitization into the crystal lattice, and this is usually near the surface. This wanted contamination is called the sensitivity center. Let's see how it works in this process. So during the exposure, the photoelectrons and silver ions are attracted to the sensitivity centers. They combine to form this latent image center, which is made of metallic silver. Looking at ripening, now crystals are actually something that we have to grow. So the length of time the crystals need to grow is considered ripening. And this determines the size of the crystals and determines their total photosensitivity. The longer the ripening, the larger the crystals or the grains. The more sensitivity the emulsion will be also. So potassium nitrate is water soluble. After ripening is complete, the emulsion is cooled, it's shredded and washed, and removes the potassium nitrate. Going into the mixing phase, the shredded emulsion is heated and melted uh, at specific temperatures and when this actually sensitizes the crystals. Several extra ingredients may be added. Dyes, which adjust the spectral sensitivity, fungicides and bactericides, antifogging agents, and hardeners. The two classifications for spectral sensitivity in x-ray film is panachromatic, which is sensitive to all colors, and orthochromatic, which is not sensitive to the red color. All this is con controlled by the dyes during the manufacturing process. The coating requires uh, very expensive uh, equipment and uh, needs to be precise. Only a few factories in the world can produce film. It ger generates 40 inch rolls of film. Uh, the adhesive is applied to the base and then the emulsion. And then there's a super coat that goes over the top of that. Then the film is cut to size and the whole process is done in the dark. So the super coat or the overcoat is the protective layer of gelatin that provides its sturdiness to the radiographic film. It has anti-static properties and it reduces the damage from things like scratches, pressure, or um, let's say contamination during storage. So do remember that silver highlight crystals, uh, they all have a differences in speed, contrast, and res resolution depending on the way it was manufactured. And the whole process is done in the dark. So the different ways to chemically create the silver highlight emulsion uh, layers creates the differences in the film. Well, what the differences are is what, how contrasty is it, how sensitive is it? You know, the observable differences in the grayscale is their contrast, and it's inversely proportional to the exposure latitude and the range of exposure techniques that produce the acceptable image. So high contrast is going to have the smaller grains, the low contrast, the larger grains. And then speed has a lot to do with it also. How fast does it react to those x-rays? So if you look at the chart over here, we have crystal sizes that are small, will have a resolution that is high because they're small and many of them, but the, it's slow, it, it reacts, it's very small. It's where these larger crystals have a lower resolution, but is much faster. So that's gonna do it for film right now. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the next 
PowerPoint slides, which talks about the types of films.